Jim, Rowan, how you going? History time. Once again. Had a couple weeks off. Talking about all this current day nonsense. I think it's more fun going back in time. 2008 is what we are up to. And uh, Wrestle Kingdom is how the year starts in New Japan. So this is the second ever Wrestle Kingdom event uh, in a long line of Tokyo Dome January 4th events important that I have my notes here okay so um, well I guess I, I suppose we'll start by gaining a brief understanding of what happened last year in 2007 um, well, okay, so the tournaments, there's four major tournaments in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Best of Super Juniors, it was the 14th edition of that. Milano Collection AT was the winner. The New Japan Cup, earlier in the year, Yuji Nagata won that. The big one, the G1 Climax, that was Hiroshi Tanahashi's. And the G1 Tag League, at the end of the year, was taken out by Giant Bernard and Travis Tomko, who won it as the IWGP Tag Team Champions. Those guys have been dominating the tag division. They've been... It's only their first reign as IWGP Tag Team Champions, but they've held it nearly a year since the 11th of March in 2007. The Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Champions, also on a, a long first reign... Since May of 2007, Dick Togo and Taka Minchinoku, the junior heavyweight champion, has uh, just changed. You know, on the 8th of December, Ryusuke Taguchi lost to Wataru Inoue, and uh, that's also his first reign as champion, Inoue, after Taguchi's first reign as champion. And the big one, the IWGP heavyweight title, that is with and around the waist of Hiroshi Tanahashi, who defeated Nagata in October to begin this, his second reign as the big dog, the ace, the top guy, the champ. And he will be in the main event, but will, I mean... Let's uh, start at the beginning. January 4th, 2008. Attendance reported 27,000. It looks pretty good. The arena, I mean, you know, it's, it's filled out. Um, so, I mean, that's not an incredible draw um, in terms of ticket sales. But still, it looks like a big event. Um, I like the stage too, it's pretty cool. There's like a, a New Japan Pro Wrestling entrance arch, and then there's the TNA Wrestling arch, and they're, they're both either side of a big screen in the middle. Uh, there was a press conference, oh, there were several press conferences. Let's have a look at this. I'll turn the sound down here. Oh, right, because, and this is what I was going to talk about anyway, I'll put this link in the in the description, but... Basically, we have here, um, obviously, TNA heavily involved in the event, given they've got their own archway. Uh, but this video I'm looking at here uh, that has highlights from press conferences is a TNA production. And, uh, yeah, it's... It, it, I mean, it's... It's cool. TNA has some, you know, some stars, some some good wrestlers at this time. But it just means that not all of the matches are on New Japan World. And I I actually started up a an Impact Plus membership just to watch some of this stuff. And even even on that, they just offered highlights. They they kind of just rushed through. Highlights of the matches just on like a, a weekly throwaway show kind of thing. But um, yeah, well, you know, 
it is what it is. But uh, it just means we might get through the first half of this card pretty quickly. All the main matches I was able to watch, if not on uh, World. So, for example, uh, there's a match with Kurt Angle later, and, and they have that in full up on... Actually, that one Impact put up on YouTube as well. But that's on Impact+. Plus. So if you're super interested, you can purchase Impact Plus and follow along with that. I don't have the links to it, though, so you'll have to do your own search and abound for them because I don't have the service anymore. And when I did this, I didn't take down uh, links. So there it is. My apologies. Anyway, uh, that's enough preamble to the first match. Unfortunately, the first match is one of these that I was talking about. Uh, it's on Impact Plus uh, in the form of highlights. AJ Styles, Christian Cage, and PT Williams versus Rise. Milano Collection AT, Minoru, and Prince Devitt. Uh, so, a brief introdu introduction of each of these guys. PT Williams uh, is a former X Division champion, but is otherwise just kind of a mid-card wrestler. AJ Styles held the X Division Championship six times at this point and is a three-time NWA World Heavyweight Champion, which until recently was TNA's highest prize. If you've been following my uh, this, this series and, and going over 2007, I increasingly was talking more and more about TNA and sometimes wondered, what well, is this even a New Japan podcast anymore because I'm talking so much about TNA and all these other promotions that New Japan's working with. But New TNA was the most important one given uh, they play such a large part of, of this, the largest show um, of, uh, you know, that kind of closes out 2007. It's, it's at the start of 2008, but obviously the build to it is all in 2007. So... Um, yeah, I've, I've covered this as we went along, all the title changes and what's going on in TNA. But, uh, so yeah, that's AJ Styles, very much a, a, a top TNA guy here. And then Christian Cage, also um, the heavyweight champion in TNA uh, twice. He's been there for the last couple of years. Arrived in 2006, I believe. Something like that. Um, okay, so that's the pretty strong uh, TNA side of things. And then on the New Japan side, we've got Prince Devitt, who's on the rise with Rise. Rising star. Popular guy. Keeps getting injured, though. That's uh, not helping him. He... Um, he returned from injury this time in May. I think he, I think it's been a couple of times in Best of Super Juniors that he's been hurt. Um, but so I don't know what I meant by returning from injury in May. Yeah, well, I guess maybe it wasn't this time. It was uh, in the Best of Super Juniors. But in any case, he and Minoru have formed a tag team called Prince Prince because uh, it's a part of Minoru's. Uh, Nickname to be Prince, and of course, Prince Devitt, so Prince Prince. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, look, Devitt's kind of the... He's, he's not really achieved anything yet. He's just pretty cool and pretty popular and, yeah, on his way up. But Minoru and Milano, of course, Milano being the Best of Super Juniors winner, those two are very strong parts of the juniors division. Minoru is a four-time IWGB Junior Heavyweight Champion, uh, so they are, that, that's, this is a, it's a junior team, but it's a, it's a strong team here for, uh, rise. I actually didn't even explain rise. So that's, um, the acronym for real international super elite, which is Nakamura's faction when, um, he was with, oh, I'm blanking on his name again. Chono. I always blank on Chono's name for some reason. I see his face. I see his hummer at the top of the stage. 
Uh, but his name is Chono. He left and formed Legend because he was with New Japan Black and he and Nakamura were kind of top of that group. And so Nakamura's had to make a new group and he named it Rise by sticking as many important sounding words into this acronym. Real, international, super, elite. Does it make sense? It doesn't matter. So, uh, yeah. Those, I, I, have I hyped this match up enough? Are you really excited to know the ins and outs of it? Well, too bad because it was covered by a TV special and it's um, just, yeah, a few highlights that were shown on Impact Plus. I'm sure it's still there if you want to go have a look. Um, but from what I was able to see, it looked to be high action, high flying opening affair. Um, Styles ended up pinning Milano collection after a Styles clash. And there is some highlights from the post-match press conference as well. And all the TNA wrestlers seem full of bluster. And reports suggest, there's a little uh, rumor mill here. Reports suggest AJ Styles was meant to face Tanahashi for the IWGP title. I think I talked about this at the end of the 2007, or the last 2007 podcast as well. But... um, yeah, New Japan decided to change the challenger to Nakamura, so Styles was bumped from one end of the card to the other. But he's still, apparently he was still popular with the crowd, uh, and that led to Minoru challenging him to a singles match, which AJ accepted. Um, I don't know. I mean, of course, AJ Styles, he's not the biggest guy, but he's considered a... A heavyweight in TNA. Did TNA even have a cruiserweight division? I don't think they did. I think the X division was their answer for that. So I don't think they have a weight division anyway, uh, or, or separate weight divisions anyway. But um, I would su- suspect that AJ Styles fits under, what is it in New Japan? 200? 210? Something like that. Pounds. Okay, so that was the opener. Don't know much about it. Um, and that's a shame because it looked pretty it looked from the small parts I saw of it it looked like it'd probably be pretty good second match on the card was for the IWGP junior heavyweight title and this was Wataru in a way defending against Christopher Daniels Um, and the how Christopher Daniels got here is a bit strange. I had to go back and look into this. So, because I, I didn't watch a lot of... I watched the start of TNA when they were on pay-per-view. I watched a bunch of those later, not at the time, but they. I found a bunch of them on YouTube and I did watch a bunch of those. But otherwise, I haven't seen that much of TNA. I wasn't really watching wrestling at the time that they peaked. That was kind of when I dropped off it. But... Um, I went back. TNA had this feast or fired match. And it had briefcases set atop of poles on each corner of the ring. Was a, was a certain Vince Russo by chance in TNA around this time? That sounds like his wheelhouse. So briefcases on top of poles that are on top of each corner of the ring... There's a briefcase, uh, or in the briefcase contains some kind of a contract, so it could either contain a title shot, or it can contain a pink slip, and the holder of the slip is fired. And Daniels picked himself up the pink slip, uh, which was just in December, just last month. So he was fired. So this means, as far as TNA are concerned... Christopher Daniels did not play a part in Wrestle Kingdom 2 because he is not a wrestler for TNA. He doesn't wrestle for them. Certainly can't represent them anywhere. However, despite them pretending this match didn't exist, they still hold the rights to the match. Okay? But because they're pretending that the match didn't happen, they don't put the match up? on their streaming service. 
but they they've got the rights so world can't have it either so no one can have it because they wanted to make this ridiculous stipulation realistic for some reason and in hindsight too by the way that they wouldn't upload it now i mean when did their service open I mean, I'm sure this isn't one of those matches that people are scrambling to go back and watch. It's probably near the top of the priority list. Fair. And given that, still, it's just... It just has created an odd situation. And just speaking on that, I mean, I don't know how they handle it. I don't know how many times they use this feast or fired match. But, I mean... I guess this would make sense... If the person had already done something worthy of being fired and then you just decided to make something of a lottery out of it and, and make some money off, uh, you know, a, a stipulation that has quite, uh, you know, very large consequences. They're either not with the company any, anymore or potentially one of the champions in the company. So, I, I, but I think if, if this is just like kind of an, not a normal match, but just a match that comes around every now and then. And we're supposed to think that these wrestlers are, you know, the best in the world and really valuable and, and, and you know, top athletes. Like, just can you imagine that in any other sport? Just being like, hey, let's, let's do a lottery and just see if we can fire someone. You know, just by chance. Just by them picking up the wrong briefcase in a ridiculous match. And then, oh, well, well, he's fired. I don't know. It just makes him look like he isn't worth much, that the company would put him in that position to me. Again, I don't know how they set this up. I dare say it is as stupid as I'm thinking it is, but it's possible that they made it make more sense than that. I don't know. Anyway, to the match. Uh... Well, a, a little um, explanation, or well, uh, preamble, I suppose, here is the Daniels is a three-time X Division champion, and he was briefly an IWGP Junior Tag Champion with Brian Danielson back in 2004. That was as Curry Man. He is uh, just, uh, I mean, he's a journeyman, he's a, he's a veteran, he's been wrestling since 93. He's got a bit of a goofy way about him, he's got some face paint around his right eye. I don't know what that's about. But um but of course, I mean he's he's a very good wrestler. This this should be a good match. So uh on anyways end, he's he's been around since ninety nine, but it's only been recently that he's really had a fire lit under him. Um and that of course led to him becoming champion. So to the match, Daniel's is very aggressive from the start. Oh, because, did I mention? I found this elsewhere. Oh, I don't have the link here. I'll see if I can find it and put it in the... I'll put it in the description if I can find it. But, um... Because I, I probably just found it on YouTube or elsewhere. But... So Daniel starts very aggressive. And that does not endear him to the crowd. But Inoue does regain some control. But the crowd don't seem to quite respect Inoue yet, either. I mean, they laugh at one point when Daniel's ducks a chop and in a way hits the post so they're on the outside of the ring daniel's just leaning up against the ring post just to try and help you picture this in a way goes for a chop daniel's ducks in a way hits the pole pole and hurts his hand and instead of the crowd being like oh no they they laugh at him <laughs> they laugh you idiot why didn't you think about that you goof um so yeah, he's 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 uh he's been doing well recently, but he's there's the the fans need more. Daniels from this point maintains control for quite some time. Um, even if it takes something like an eye poke, he's not above that. But he does help Inoue out by being so obnoxious that the fans do get behind Inoue's comebacks a little bit more when it uh, when they do come. And there's a, well, there's a part where they trade pin attempts. Neither of them can be kept down for a decisive three count. 
Daniels goes for the Angels Wings, which is a double underhook sit-out face buster. So a pedigree, basically. Oh, but except a sit-out sit out pedigree kind of thing. Anyway, um, Inoue powers out of that one, though, and they trade strikes. Inoue wins with a slap across Daniels' face, giving him enough time for the staggering blow, which is a cross-legged brain buster. That earns him a two count. Daniels recovers pretty quickly, but Inoue hits him with a spear and... Lucky for him, he has a new trick up his sleeve with the same cross-legged setup, which I'm not sure how much difference really can possibly make. But cross-legged setup, in a way, instead hits a sit-out driver. And he calls that the Oration Flame. Oreki- oh, no. Oration Flame. I think that sounds better than Orakion. Arachion Flame. Actually, that sounds cool too. He's got two cool names. I don't know what Arachion is. Should we look that up? Arachion. Arachion. Is it the Spanish or? Uh, okay. Spanish. Let's see here. Oracion. How about that? It's a prayer. Okay. The prayer flame. Or a speech. Or a sentence? Wait. Feminine noun. Activity. Yeah, I think it's a... I think it means pray. Prayer. Okay. So, um... Oracion. Flame. The prayer flame. Season retain the championship. Prayer Flame doesn't sound like... Actually, I think that's a pretty cool name because it sounds like it's very soft or like not not a... I don't know. It, it, obviously, Prayer Flame, it sounds very calming. It sounds very like it's a, not such a violent move. But it is. I don't know. Sometimes that stuff doesn't work, but I think that's a pretty cool name. Anyway, and it's a cool move. Like I said, good finish. The title is retained. After what I rated is a good match, the rating system is back. The first one, obviously, I could not rate because I couldn't really watch the match. But um, rating goes terrible, bad, disappointing, fine, good, very good, great, special. And this one, as many do, fell in the middle. It's just good. And I think that's with a fair credit, fair amount of credit to Daniels, by the way. I think he, I don't want to say carry, but I think... He's responsible for the pacing of the match. And um, I don't know. I feel like he was leading the way and led this to being a good match. Um, Yeah, you don't necessarily need to go out of your way to see it. Like if I can't find the link and it's not as simple as just clicking a link somewhere, then I don't know. If you like these guys, it's it's worthwhile. It's a good match. It's enjoyable. Well worked. Um... Finish kind of came out of nowhere a little bit. Um, it, it was very, very kind of quick comeback from Daniels hitting one of his better moves. But <clears throat> yeah, and, and that actually I, I noted here that it made it to me, I it maybe hovered between fine and good just for that that finish not quite being what I thought it could be, but I'll give the benefit of the doubt to Daniels just not being ready for Inoue's move set and the champion taking full advantage. Perhaps that's a and and in fairness, I mean it's a a new move, the finish, eventually. So yeah. Anyway, okay, that is number two. Match number three. Similar to the opener, unfortunately, uh, TNA only shows a brief highlights package for this match between a couple of monsters, Abyss versus Manabu Nakanishi. It starts in the ring, but spills outside and then eventually onto the ramp where Abyss slams Nakanishi down long enough to whip out his thumbtacks. It gets a reaction from the crowd, as it always does, I suppose. It's... uh... I guess, especially in Japan, they would see... Well, most certainly in New Japan, they would almost never see that. So, something 
something different for them. Nakanishi manages to avoid the thumbtacks though, uh, leaping off the ramp as he drives Abyss's face or drives Abyss down face first into the pointy pile with a bulldog. Like he's got a, a bit of a mask, but he's um he's he's bleeding a lot from his hands and arms though, which obviously would have taken most of that impact. Um He continues the match though, he survives a mana bower, the um the back breaker rack, a torture rack. And then he hits a choke slam of his own, but Nakanishi survives that and finishes Abyss with the German suplex, a huge, a monster German suplex on a monster. So backstage, Abyss wanted a, a rematch. He chases the photographers, photographers around backstage. He wants a rematch. Um, I just noticed I didn't really set up how these guys were doing. I don't know much about Abyss. Obviously, I think he invented the Monsters Ball match in TNA. Or, you know, didn't invent it, but like that's his match type. Which, I don't know exactly what that is. I think it's like something to do with what weapons you get. Or, I don't know, whatever. Um, But yeah, just like a big, scary, hardcore dude. And then Nakanishi is kind of just floating in New Japan. Mid-card, does some tag stuff. Um, been around forever. You know, I mean, he debuted in the 80s, I'm pretty sure, for New Japan. Or early 90s, maybe. He's been around for a long time. And just never really reached... Lofty heights, I suppose. Um, I mean, you know, he's definitely been <clears throat> in the title picture at different points in his career, but at this point, that's it's not it's not the case. So, um, but that was, a, I mean, that sounded like it'd be an interesting match. Uh, you know, the, the the whole monster versus monster thing. I get that. So, great. That's unfortunately all I've got for that one. Match number three. For match number four, however, this one was on World. So we get the full match. It's Koji Kanemoto, Ryusuke Taguchi, Takashi Izuka, and Tiger Mask versus Katsushi Takamura, Masato Tanaka, Tatsuhito Takaiwa, and Yutaka Yoshi. So this is an interpromotional match as well, but not with TNA. Yoshi and Takamura are from the recently renamed Tatsumi Fujinami promotion, Muga. Muga? Muga. I would think it's Muga. Muga. Um, Because that used to be called Tradition. And... Oh, wait. Sorry. Got that the wrong way around. It's Muga. It was Muga. And it's beginning, it's becoming Dreadition. D-R-A-D-I-T-I-O-N. Dreadition. Takamura started out in New Japan and has made his living mostly between here in New Japan and all Japan as well, with some cameos sprinkled in elsewhere. Yoshi also started at the New Japan Dojo um, and has had odd peaks of success. He won the tag titles with Tanahashi, um years ago, followed by largely nothing else, which led to him leaving in 2006. And some new success was found with Muga, capturing the Dragon Cup in a knockout tournament at the end of 2007. So coming in with some confidence, Yoshi. And Tanaka and Takaiwa, they're from Zero One Max, the new version of the promotion Shinya Hashimoto founded. Uh, and then sold before his death. Takaiwa is one of the wrestlers that Hashimoto took with him to form the original Zero One, though. He's a decorated junior heavyweight in both singles and tag competition with titles across many top promotions over the years. Tanaka is the reigning Zero One world heavyweight champion. 
having just won the title last month for the first time. He's also been a champion across uh, several other promotions. But um, unlike his teammates, he got his start in Atsushi Onita's infamous FMW, which inspired the style of ECW, for those unfamiliar. And if you are familiar with ECW, you, re- you might remember Tanaka um, being a part of ECW and even becoming ECW World Heavyweight Champion for a brief spell in 99. But um, in terms of his recent work, it's mostly been with Zero One and... He, yeah, I mean, I guess just comes in with that reputation of being able to cop a lot of chair shots to the head, for better or worse. Well, most certainly for worse. But the other team is a collection of the top junior heavyweight talent New Japan has to offer with the perennial stopgap Izuka, another floater. Taguchi was the IWGP junior heavyweight champ, as mentioned earlier. But the, uh, I just lost it last month too, in a way, once again. Um, And then Tiger Mask and Koji are both multiple time junior champions. So a strong New Japan side with Iska there ready for a pinfall if New Japan must lose. And um, yeah, a collection of some interesting guys, many of which from New Japan's past. But um, for those of you playing at home, If you've got this up on New Japan World and you want to know who's who, Yoshi stands out in his bright pinkish purple number. Uh, As does Takamura with his fiery pants and hair. And then Tanaka's in the red and black shorts with a bit of with a bit of hair, and Takaiwa is both missing hair and flair, just wearing black trunks. On the other side, Tiger Mask should be easy to pick out. Iska is the thickest one. Kanemoto is the tall one with the red and pink trim on his trunks. And Taguchi's got a big messy mullet. But to the match. They all rush in. And then the last two in the ring are there to start the match proper. Funny how that just seems to always work out. And they are Tiger and Takamura. That's who starts. Tiger avoids a power bomb before hitting a Slick kick. Taguchi tags in and Kanemoto next as they keep Takamura away from his corner. All four attack him at once. And then Koji teases teases his opponents with a tag before pulling the legal man away. Iska has his turn, landing a suplex off the turnbuckle. And the New Japan team are in complete control with each of the guys getting involved there. And until Iska ruins it, it was inevitable. Everyone from the intruded team gangs up on poor Dopey Iska and his teammates, uh, oh, and keep his teammates away. Yoshi gets a big reaction with a body splash in the corner because he's a thick fella. Thick fella. The, um, there's a dangerous exploder on Takaiwa, and that gives Iska a chance to tag out, and Koji has his chance to claw back the advantage. He gives... Tanaka's face a wash with his boot, the old face wash, and Tanaka shows resilience rising to match and beat Koji in a palm strike battle before then hitting a brain buster. So then the legal men switch again to Taguchi and Takaiwa. The latter stopped Taguchi in his tracks with a mean sit-out scoop slam pile driver, well I guess scoop pile driver. He tags in Yoshi, who is set to continue the beatdown on Taguchi, but Izuka grabs a hold of him at the ropes. The New Japan guys are rushed, and everyone's cleared out of the ring except the legal participants, again. A German suplex is attempted by Taguchi to no avail at first, until Tiger Mask hits a dropkick, which helps him make the lift. Tanaka stops any momentum with a lariat, and Yoshi pins Taguchi with a diving body press off the top to screams from at least one audience member. Um, Because, yeah, once again, he's a big fella. That's a lot of weight coming down on poor old Taguchi. But uh, that was the finish. Yoshi on Taguchi. The brawl continues at ringside, particularly between Koji and Tanaka. I can see them facing off. But uh, this one was good. Nothing to stand out about it. 
it was an enjoyable 10 minutes. Everyone performed well. Um, so watch it if you want. Link in the description. Our next match, we go back to Impact Plus. It was a hardcore tag team match between Team 3D, Brother Devon and Brother Ray versus Great Bash Heels, Togi Makabe and Toru Yano. Team 3D need no introduction to fans of American wrestling. They're one of the legendary tag teams of ECW and WWE, and their success has continued into TNA since debuting for them in 2005. They captured the NWA tag titles, and, and then when that NWA-TNA alliance ended, they were the tag TNA tag champions as recently as July last year, 2007. But if anyone in New Japan is ready for a hardcore match, it's Yano and Makabe. Yano's about as devious as they come, and Makabe makes just about every match he's in into a hardcore match anyway. So this pair, um, this GBH pair, lost in the semi-final to the eventual tag league winners, um, Bernard and Tomko. But um, they've had this interfactional feud with Rise for the rest of 2007. Um, this is a, a quick deviation from that, but like I said, well within their wheelhouse. Sounds like it would be an interesting match, but unfortunately, um, all we got was highlights on Impact+. Plus. It appeared to be a bruising affair that at least included a trash can and a ladder, and Maccabi's chain, of course, and then there was a table. Of course, it's got to be a table. It's a Team 3D match. But Maccabi's on the wrong end of the, the table. He takes a bubba bomb off the top rope through that, and then Devon pins Maccabi after the 3D. So that's kind of a couple of the only highlights I saw, and both on Maccabi. Not that that's necessarily surprising. I mean, Yano's... I mean, you know, I mean, Yano was second to Makabe, but they're both strong guys, so either way. Brother Ray claims afterwards in the backstage comments that despite coming to fight here since 1997, Team 3D have never lost in Japan. I wonder if we will see the day soon that that changes. But, um, yeah, once again, not really a, very much a TNA-style match rather than a, a New Japan-style match. Um, but, hey, they're mixing it up. And TNA has some guys with name value that is uh, going to be useful for, well, one would think, useful for selling tickets to a big event like this. I think we'll probably end on the next one here. And fortunately, we do get to see it. It's on World, and it is between the team of Akira, Jushin Thunder Liger, Masahiro Chono, Riki Choshu. All of those guys represent Legend, but they're also joined by Tatsumi Fujinami. So huge names on that side of the bracket. And then... Great Bash Heel uh, are in this match as uh, well represented by Gato and Jado, but then there's also Voodoo Murders, which is an All Japan faction. The representatives here joining Gato and Jado are Shuji Kondo, Taru, and Yashi. We brother Yashi. Um, well, let's. But I'll I'll introduce each guy here. So we got Akira who. He joined the New Japan Dojo and debuted in the mid-80s. And then he spent the next two decades with New Japan. He captured the IWGP Junior title once, um, but then he left in 2003, and he's been wrestling in All Japan. He made the switch back to New Japan to join Legend uh, when it was established in kind of mid to late 2007. And for a bit of trivia, I mean, I covered this in the corresponding podcast, but Kazuchika Okada's professional debut took place on the undercard of Akira's first match back, where he um, 
Okada lost to fellow young lion Tetsuya Naito. But, uh, yeah, I mean, look, the other, that's, Akira has, has been away for a bit, so I thought I'd at least give a, back, a bit of a background on him, but the other guys, really, I shouldn't need to introduce. Liger, legend, Ch- Chono, legend, Choshu, legend, Fujinami, legend. So, and that's why they, you know, that's why it's a good name. Proper name for a, a group of legends is just call them legend. Good thinking. Um, okay. Of course, all on the kind of back ends of the careers, but still the fans like seeing him. And Liger's still going strong. He's had a long career, but he's still going strong. Um, and this is Fujinami's first match back in New Japan in two years, so that's pretty cool. The fans get a kick out of that. But uh, on the other team, Gato and Jado, of course, uh, they were champions at this point last year, the junior tag champs, but no longer the case. But they're always in the running for the titles. They're still top guys in that division. Their teammates... Um, there was a bit of a, a shake-up in Voodoo Murders, actually. In 2007, Kojima shocked all Japan fans when he joined Voodoo Murders and he became the group's co-leader along with Taru. And then Kojima and Taru won the World Tag Team Championship. Uh, of course, this is in all Japan. And they held them until the day before this event. They lost to Joe Doring and Keiji Muto. So... Um, yeah, and then Kondo is, he's kind of the king of the junior division in all Japan. He, um, he was champion for, over, for nearly 500 days before losing to the current champion, a man on the rise, Katsuhiko Nakajima. And then who's left? Yashi. He is probably there to lose. Let's see. Let's pick him out, though, for those playing at home. Yashi is the loudmouth hippie on the mic at the start. And Kondo's got a colorful mullet, uh, like a mohawk mullet. That's pretty cool. And then Taru is the one in his Halloween costume. Gato has a hat and bandana. And his partner, Jado, is the bald guy that just looks like a wrestler. And... Um, I shouldn't really need to point point those guys out, to be honest. I shouldn't really need to point out anyone on the other team either, but let's uh, quickly. Chono has black pants. Choshu has white boots. Fujinami has black boots. Akira has the pants and the makeup. And Liger has a pretty famous bodysuit you might have seen before, if you're bothering to listen to this. To the match. So yeah, Yashi was talking some trash at the beginning, before the match. So uh, the vets hobble down to teach these brats a lesson. And uh, the crowd are excited for a Choshu lariat, but Jado ducks and he hits Fujinami instead. Oh no. The match then becomes one-on-one when Choshu doesn't miss Kondo after he tags in and the crowd liked that one. Liga dumps Kondo out and baseball slides him into the barricade before leaping up or leaping at him from the top rope. And then Akira dives at him too before... The match returns to the ring. Liger tags him in and uh, Akira, and he's doing well until an impressively powerful pop-up power slam that Kondo calls the original. And the bad guys clear the opposite corner. They team up on Akira. Taru takes Chono right up on the ramp. And then Akira nearly gets rid of Yashi to make the tag, but he's dragged back into the corner. Meanwhile, Tano, sorry, Taru, Channels Muto with a long run up then down the ramp, hitting Chono with a lariat. Yashi and Kondo combine for a neat senton off Kondo's shoulders, but Akira still manages to kick, his, kick away his opponents and he scurries back to his corner, tags in Fujinami. The crowd comes alive as the dragon takes out his opponents one by one with dragon screws. Chono gets involved and tags in Choshu, who assists a pile driver from the top turnbuckle on Yashi before locking in Sasori Gatame, otherwise known as the sharpshooter. Lucky for Yashi, though, his teammates break it up quickly and the match becomes an all-in brawl. Liger smacks Yashi with a shote in the corner, then sets up Akira for his diving splash, the uh, Musabi pla- no, Musas- Musasabi press. 
Choshi makes the final play with the Lariat, and as predicted, Yashi eats a pinfall after a good match. Very short, but everything it was supposed to be, and once again, nothing you should probably go out of your way for, but it was probably, I think the problem here is, it, I think this match was almost more about the entrances than it was, I mean, obviously, and then like the little spots in the match where you get to see the Ricky Lariat, you get to see the sharpshooter, you get to see um, uh, the dragon screws from Fujinami, like those little moments, definitely, but I think the crowd would have just been excited, you know, popping for their entrances, which unfortunately just weren't played. We didn't see them on New Japan World, um, which is a shame, but yeah, still, we got to see the Ricky Lariats, and who doesn't love a Ricky Lariat? Um, okay, so that, I think, will bring us to the end of this one the matches to come in the next podcast uh and we'll cover these in more detail because we've got more well i mean there's just more meat on these bones i think great muta versus hiroki goto is the next match we've got uh well there's one more i uh, know there's two more impact plus matches the iwgp tag team titles are on the line giant bernard and travis tomko dominant champions for nearly a year take on one of the most dominant tag teams in, in history, the Steiner brothers, Rick Steiner and Scott Steiner, over from TNA to challenge for the IWGP championship. Uh, junior, sorry, IWGP tag team championship. And then we have the IWGP third belt, which Kurt Angle holds from IGF, Inoki Genome Federation. He's taking on Yuji Nagata. Um... I spoke about that one before. That one is on Impact Plus, but I found it on YouTube. Hopefully it's still there because uh, that's a good one. And then the main event, IWGP Heavyweight Championship, Hiroshi Tanahashi defending against Shinsuke Nakamura. So we will run through those on the next one and start the year 2008. Start going through it in detail and learning about what went on back then? Yes, okay, that's enough. Good, so thank you for listening. Until next time, have a good one. <laughs>